Hi, it is Thursday the 18th of March and I continue to read and wonder my way through Luke's Gospel. Today it's Luke chapter 19 verses 11 through 28 and well it's a harsh story. <laughs> I mean yesterday we were hearing about Zacchaeus and having lunch with Zacchaeus and it was it's a fun story. It's terrific. Yeah there's people grumbling that Jesus is eating with you know with sinners and outsiders who may well be one and the same. Um, but today it gets really harsh so um, so buckle in okay and I'll try to give it a little context maybe um, but well let's just jump in and see what happens Luke 19 verses 11 through 28 as they were listening to this he went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately so Jesus said a noble man went to a distant country to get royal power for himself and then return. He summoned ten of his slaves and gave them ten pounds and said to them, Do business with these until I come back. But the citizens of his country hated him. They sent a delegation after him saying, We do not want this man to rule over us. When he returned, having received royal power, he ordered these slaves to whom he had given the money to be summoned so that he might find out what they had gained by trading. The first came forward and said, Lord, your pound has made ten more pounds. He said to him, Well done, good slave. Because you've been trustworthy in a very small thing, take charge of ten cities. And then the second came, saying, Lord, your pound has made five pounds. And he said to him, And you, rule over five cities. And then the other came, saying, Lord, here is your pound. I wrapped it up in a piece of cloth, for I was afraid of you. Because you are a harsh man. You take what you did not deposit. You reap what you did not sow. He said to him, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked slave. You knew, did you, that I was a harsh man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what th that, that which I did not sow? Why then did you not put my money in the bank? Then when I returned, I could have collected it with interest. He said to the bystanders, Take the pound from him and give it to the one who has ten pounds. And they said to him, Lord, he has ten pounds. I tell you, to all those who have, more will be given. But for those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. But as for these enemies of mine, who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and slaughter them in my presence. Like I said, kind of harsh. Um, now, <laughs> some of you may, may feel that there's a familiar a familiarity to this 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 parable in fact it's very close to the parable told in Matthew pretty sure chapter 25 uh, the parable of the talents right uh, where where the rich landowner is going away and he and he and he summons his three slaves and he gives um, each of them talents um, I believe it was ten talents five talents and one talent and the one who had the ten made it to 20 and the one who made it five made it to ten and the one who had one kept it, buried it in the ground, and then gave it back, and, and basically very similar story after that. Um, uh, although he's not, no one's slaughtered in this one, uh, although he is he is cast out into outer darkness where there was wailing and gnashing of teeth, I think, is what happened. So very similar, um, but not exactly the same. Now, a uh, little, little bit of history here. Um, so, Mark's gospel is is the earliest gospel. Uh, lots of reasons to believe that. Um, not the least of which is that both Luke and Matthew's gospel quote it. They they take stories from it whole as bolus, exactly lift them out. So there are bits of Mark that show up in Matthew, show up in Luke. Some of it adapted, some of it expanded, some of it exactly as it was. But obviously both the authors of Luke and Matthew are borrowing from Mark. We have that. There are some bits, however, that exist in Luke and Matthew, uh, almost identical or quite similar, that don't show up in Mark at all. And so the theory is then that there is another source that Luke and Matthew also draw from um, that isn't Mark. But we don't know what it is. It, it, we don't have an extant version of it. It doesn't exist. Uh, so it's called the Q um, Gospel or the Q document. Q is quell. Um, uh, anyway, you don't need to know all that stuff other than there is this sense that there's another source and it may be a source of sayings and parables, sayings and teachings. 
this for me feels like um, something that would have come out of this this source, this Q gospel, uh, this um, this collection of stories. And for me, it feels to me as if Matthew has taken it almost exactly as it was, this parable of the talents, um, and then Luke has taken it and he has adapted it into a and added a little historical context. And why I say that is also knowing a little bit of my classical history and my certainly uh, first century um, Jerusalem history. King Herod, um, like the great King Herod, who died about the same time Jesus is born, um, uh, he divided his kingdom between three sons. I think he had a bunch of sons. He divided between three, and I'm going to tell you that they are Antipas and Philip and Archelaus. Don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure about the last one, Archelaus. Yeah, Herod Antipas, Herod Philip, and uh, Archelaus. Uh, and Archelaus gets the biggest chunk of all of that. It's, he gets about half the kingdom. And the thing is, uh, that has to be ratified by Rome, right? You, you can't divide a kingdom that's part of, of, of the Roman Empire. So you need you need Roman approval, which at that so that would be Caesar Augustus. You need the approval of, of Augustus. And Archelaus was so despised um, that in fact the story was that a delegation of Jews from Jerusalem went to Augustus and said, please, we do not want Archelaus to be our king. This is actually recorded history. We do not want that. Uh, Augustus considered it apparently and did give Archelaus the kingdom but didn't allow him to be called a king. So, a little something in there. Um, anyway, all of that seems to fit into this story, right? This whole, um, the, 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 the citizens hated him, sent a delegation after him saying, we don't want this man to rule over us. All of that, that seems to be an Archelaus story. Archelaus, uh, historically, was known um, to be super indulgent uh, and incredibly cruel very harsh and cruel so the final line as for the enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them bring them here and slaughter them in my presence that sounds like Archelaus so it feels to me like Luke has taken the parable and he uh, he has put it into history right or used history to shape it a little bit and there are some other differences that may or may not be significant I mean, apparently, he summoned ten of his slaves and gave them ten pounds. So it sounds like a pound each. And one of them went from one pound to ten pounds. So, wow, he is really talented. Uh, and he gets to be in charge of ten cities. One went from one pound to five pounds. He gets to be in charge of five cities. One did nothing. And he's going to be punished. We know that. His pound is going to be taken away from him. There's no mention of the other seven. <laughs> Uh, what happened to the other seven? <laughs> it feels incomplete to me. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm confused about that a little bit. Which again makes me think that Luke is adapting this to fit into a little bit of history, but loses track of... I don't know. It's worth wondering. What happened to the other seven? Are, are we meant to consider them? Um, so I'm not sure about that. Um... When we read parables, we usually make the person in charge. Um, we usually make them God or, or Jesus, right? So, um, you know, when, when the nobleman goes away, that must be Jesus going away. And in fact, Luke sort of says that, doesn't he? Um, as they were listening to this, he went on to tell a parable, Luke says, because he was near Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. So Luke has just told us why Jesus is telling this parable. And if you've meditated with me in the past or wondered with me in the past, you know I have an issue with that. <laughs> Parables are dynamic stories that change all the time. They meet us where we are. Um, so Luke has not only tried to grind uh, to, to ground this in history, thereby taking away some of its ability to, to meet me where I am, but has also told me what it means. So why bother with the parable at all? Why not just tell me the kingdom of God is not going to appear immediately? Get over it. Um, so Luke has decided what this means for him in this time and place, and that's great. I live in a different time and place, and so I think the parable can do more. And in fact, if I read it the way that he is suggesting it, that, that this is just to tell us 
uh, that the kingdom of God is not going to appear immediately. Uh, and to say, basically, Jesus is going to go away and leave us in charge of doing things. So some of us had better be earning well. So um, we better be um, spreading the word and moving from one pound to ten or one pound to five. If we just do nothing with it, then Jesus is going to come back um, and be very disappointed in us. And Jesus is going to come back and slaughter his enemies. Now that plays for some people that does not work with me very well. I do not, I, I hold no stock in a Jesus who slaughters his enemies. That to me is completely inconsistent with the Jesus that I have uh, had revealed to me in, in the gospels. That, that just doesn't work. To me, that's Archelaus, that's not Jesus. So then I have to wonder, is there anything in this parable for me? Has Luke twisted it too much? He's tried to decipher it, and they're taking some of the power away. He's tried to, to, to ground it in history, and therefore taking some of the power away. I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, there are some true things in this parable that I nod and go, yeah, okay. True then, true now. Um, the, one, the, 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 the one who has the one pound and done nothing with it, they take it away from him. Give it to the one who has 10 pounds. But Lord, he already has 10 pounds, they say. Yeah, yeah. And for those who have much, more will be given. And those who have very little, those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. That was true in the first century. That seems to be abundantly true in the 21st century. The rich get rich and the poor get poorer. Um, and, and, and those who have very little are often targeted. Um, so, yeah. That that's a that's a harsh world, uh, and I recognize that that world. Um, seems a bit of a downer uh, for a parable, just to remind me that I live in a harsh world. So I have to wonder, what does this mean to me? Um, you know, as I've spent some time in my life uh, recently reflecting on my privilege and the colonial nature of, of the institutions that, that that have supported me and that I support and I look at systemic racism and I look at my part in, in so many things that I recognize as being wrong uh, and I want to change them but I have to confess that it's hard because these systems have rewarded me and so on one hand I am rewarded and on the other hand I am afraid so I start to wonder about uh, about these slaves who were given um, given the ten pounds and the one who took it went from one and went to ten. Um, did he do that because he believes uh, in his master's kingdom, uh, or does he do that because he is afraid uh, and and he's good at what he does, so he'll be rewarded for? It, but does he really believe in what he's doing, or is he just good at it? The one who went from one to five is he also? Uh, similarly, uh, it doesn't say that either of them do this with any misgivings. But again, reflecting on my life, 21st century, Norm Seelie now, today, I can see how you win, how you achieve, even while you're supporting a system that you don't believe in. But maybe, maybe the subversive part of this is so by achieving, by making the master happy, he's now in charge of 10 cities right? And maybe those 10 cities can be managed justly, mercifully. Maybe they become a pocket. The one who did the five, he could do the same thing. And now 15 cities within this, in this imperfect kingdom, 15 cities um, are better and their citizens are respected and, 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 and it be, they become life-giving and that life grows and maybe that could overcome the kingdom one day. Is that their plan? It's not in the parable, I know that. But I'm invited to wonder about that. Um, I, I think, you know, um, about the one who, who, who just wrapped it in cloth and, and he's punished for that. Um, is that because his misgivings are so great that he does not want to contribute to this kingdom? The people don't like this kingdom. The people don't like this king. He doesn't want to support this system at all, and so he doesn't, and he acknowledges it. Yeah. You're a harsh man. You take what's not yours. Wow, I hear those words in a colonial context, and they hit home. Uh, you reap where you do not sow. Yeah, I recognize that. 
So is he standing up to the master, to the nobleman, to the, the one, the man who would be king? Is he standing up to him? Um, it doesn't go very well for him. But then I wonder what would happen if all 10 of them had said no. We won't do anything with his money at all. We won't steal it, but we will not make it more. And upon returning, all 10 of them had said, well, no, we're with the people. What would have happened? Uh, would he have slaughtered those 10? Or would he have looked at those 10 and went, I need at least some of you. I can't. If I get rid of all of you, I have no support. I can't manage this. I don't know. And, and again, the parable doesn't tell me, but in the 21st century, I'm invited to wonder, what is the best way to affect change? Is it to stand up and say to the nobleman, no, because I will no longer support the way that you take what is not yours and reap what has not been sown by you. Is that the best way or is it better to play the game and then get control and power and work from the inside and turn things around? I don't know, but I'm invited to wonder about that today. And maybe that's what happened to the other seven. Maybe the other seven are wondering what they should have done. Uh, maybe they haven't figured it out yet. Um, maybe the other seven are us. Um, unsure what the best way to affect change really is. Is it to stand up um, and, and refuse to participate? Or is it to participate but move things in such a way that change can happen? See, for me, this is more about... Th th there's more going on here than letting me know that Jesus is going to be gone for a while and that I have to be good to people. Um, and the other one, and, and, it, and it shows up in the other parable too, um, the other in, in, in the Matthew version of this, um, where, where he says, um, let me get it right here. Um, yes, he said, okay, I will judge you by your own words, he says to, to the one who has done nothing but wrap it in a cloth. I will judge you by your own words, you wicked slave. You knew, did you, that I was a harsh man, taking what I did not deposit, reaping what that which I did not sow? Then why then did you not put my money in the bank? Then when I returned, I could have collected it with interest. Take this pound for him, give it to the one who has ten pounds. You knew, did you, that I was a harsh man, taking what I did not deposit, reaping what I did not sow? So... What we're hearing here is, is that this person assumes his master is a harsh, cruel man. Same thing in the other version of the parable. Except in the other version of the parable, there's no real evidence of that. Um, it's an assumption he's made. So for a moment, let's assume then that, that, that this nobleman, that this would-be king, um, let's assume this is God. I begin to wonder... Um, how I talk about God, how I preach God, how I experience God. If I talk about God, if I preach God as, as a judgmental God uh, who expects everybody to toe the line, and when we don't toe the line, we are sent to hell, uh, expects everybody to do their best all the time, and when we don't do our best, we are punished. When I talk about God that way, when I preach God that way, am I surprised that I look at the world and discover it to be harsh and cruel and violent? like Archelaus. If, however, I assume that God is more like the God revealed in Jesus, one who is embracing and diverse and genderful and loving and forgiving, if I experience God that way, if I preach God that way, if I talk about God that way, Am I not more likely to recognize the world as a place where there can be hope and, and love, where there can be change and transformation? Um, is this my opportunity here? 
Jesus is about to go into Jerusalem, we're told. So, so we're getting really close to the Easter moment, right? So Jesus uh, is going into Jerusalem to essentially claim his kingdom, uh, reveal God. Historically, we know uh, in the lifetime of many of those who had heard this story, Archelaus is a king who demanded his kingdom. Um, and, and to those who opposed him, he was harsh and cruel, slaughtering people. Is this our invitation, this parable? Does this invite us to wonder about the God that we recognize? Who is God to you? Is God the one revealed in Jesus, or is God the one revealed in Archelaus? The one who, 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 who comes to us where we are, who, who reveals his kingdom on, on, on a cross through his own suffering and pain. Or is God revealed in the one who demands that we support him whether we want to or not, and punishes us when we do not? It's a choice that we're offered in this parable, perhaps. Um, and those, that choice, well, it, it, it matters. It, it changes a lot. And, and obviously, you know that I choose the Jesus <laughs> God, right? I choose the king who comes to me where I am and loves me. But I have to confess that every now and again, what comes out of my mouth is Archelaus that God of judgment and oh, gonna get those people. When I speak that way, when I act that way, am I surprised that the world is harsh? You knew, did you, that I was a harsh man, taking what I did not deposit, reaping what I did not sow? And so, does God take us at our word? Well, I think our word does shape our faith, and our faith does shape the way we look at the world. So this might be an invitation to wonder about how we speak about God, especially when we speak about those who do not agree with us. I'm going to leave it there for you to wonder. I hope you call somebody. I hope you talk about the story. Read Matthew 25. Read that version of the parable. Compare them. See what's different and if it matters. There's a lot in here, I think. Uh, even though I think Luke has tried to ruin it for me, <laughs> I don't think he's succeeded. Um, and I hope that there's much in this for you as well. With that in mind, let us pray. Loving God, we thank you that you meet us where we are, where we are in our lives, where we are as we wonder. We thank you for this time of wondering this opportunity to acknowledge who we think you are, to recognize how we talk about you, even when we're just talking to ourselves. God, help us to recognize that you are revealed more in Jesus than in Archelaus or any other angry despotic power. God, let your spirit move through us that we might recognize your action in the world, that we might follow, that we might flourish. We pray through the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. Amen. So that's it for me today. I, uh, I look forward to checking in with you tomorrow. And until we do check in, please know who you are, what you do. <sighs> Incredibly important. You are loved. You're not alone. God bless you.